So I want you to imagine that you are a medieval European farmer in the year 900, and you have one burning question on your mind, which is you have one acre of land, how much of it should you plant with crops? Well, first off, if you only have one acre of land, you're screwed, but for the sake of argument. And the naive answer here, of course, is all of it. Uh, but if you do that, uh, you're going to starve eventually. Because if you continually, continuously cultivate the same crop of land over and over, year after year, you will wear out the nutrients in the soil, and your crop will get poorer and poorer, and you will starve, and that's no fun. So to solve this, um, luckily, like many other fundamental problems in computer science, this was solved in the 1970s. Uh, so I'm going to turn to this paper on what I would call the world's simplest garbage collection algorithm. Uh, and it works like this. You divide your fields, uh, sorry, your memory space into <laughs> two halves. Um, and so when your program wants some memory, you allocate, and you allocate, and you allocate, and you allocate. Great. And then you get to the halfway point, and you say, stop, slow down. I need to collect some garbage. Except actually, you don't collect the garbage. You collect the non-garbage. What you do is you trace from all the pointers that your program is currently actively using. You trace out and recursively find all the objects, all the allocations that are reachable in your program. And as you're doing this, you copy them into the other half of your memory space. And then you're done, because you can just throw away all the other stuff, right? You copy all the stuff you could possibly use. And that's it. That's garbage collection. Um, so I'm, of course, eliding some details. But this algorithm <laughs> is truly marvelously simple. And learning it was what got me to believe that garbage collection, instead of being this heinously complicated thing that I could poss never possibly understand, was actually something I could implement. Um, and then I did. Uh, so anyway, I don't know where Cheney got the idea for this algorithm from, but maybe he knew something about medieval agriculture. Uh, because what farmers in, you know, prior to about the year 900 in medieval Europe did was they split their fields in two, and they would grow on one half until the harvest came, and then they would cut it down, and the next season they would grow on the other half. And they would just alternate back and forth, and this way the ground has time to recover, time to recover its nutrients. Um, and as you can see, this is a marvelously similar idea. But there is one difference, which is with the garbage collection algorithm, it was clear why we had to split it exactly in half. Right? We needed half our space left over to guarantee we had enough space left to copy possibly all the objects that we were using. But with this new algorithm, um, with this uh, crop rotation algorithm, it's not clear why it should be one half. And so somebody eventually got the bright idea, why don't we try two thirds? <laughs> it's just a simple change of a magic constant. You know, what could go wrong? Well, to understand what could possibly go wrong, all I have to do is think about the last time I tried to upgrade my Haskell compiler. <laughs> it didn't go well. And it didn't go well because I had descended into dependency hell. <laughs> and this is exactly where medieval European farmers were stuck for 200 years from about, oh, and I should demonstrate. To know how long it took, you just need to look at the uh, timestamps. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, what do I mean when I say that they were in dependency hell? Well, let's take a look at some of the things that needed to change in order to support this simple change from two fields to three fields. First off, you can't just grow any crops. You need to grow some crops that fix nitrogen in the soil, because cereal crops take nitrogen out of the soil. If you grow that on 2 thirds of your land, you, it doesn't have enough time to recover. But if you grow the right crops in the right order, in particular if you grow legumes, which add nitrogen to the soil, more or less, then you're good. OK. Uh, but you're also cultivating more of your land, right? You're going to need to plow that land. And also, um, you're going to need to plow it a little deeper in order to bring some nutrients to the surface of the soil. So for that, you're going to need a heavier plow called a karuka. And to pull that plow, you could keep on using oxen, but um, you're going to need a lot of them, like a team of maybe up to 10. And it gets unwieldy to turn those around, and then you have to support all of them. And it would just be nicer if you had horses. Um, but the problem with horses is that unlike oxen, they can't consist, especially if you're working them hard, they can't consist just on grass. They need some food with protein in it, like oats. And where are you going to get those oats, right? Where's the surplus of food going to come from that you can feed your horses from? Well, if you adopted the three-field system, <laughs> then you would have a surplus, and you'd be able to feed your horses. But oh, look, now our dependency graph has a cycle in it. 
<sighs> and that isn't even the end of the story. Um, nor is this the end of the story. But first off, if you use the same sort of yoke that you're going to use on your oxen, if you put a heavy load on your horse under an ox yoke, it actually cuts off its windpipe. Uh, so that's no good. So you need to invent a special yoke for your horses. Also, before this, they didn't use horseshoes widely. Um, but if you have your horse uh, walking through muddy ground all the time, its uh, hooves get soft, and then it can't work anymore. So you need horseshoes. Um, and you probably want to change the shape of your field because you're plowing more. Remember how I said it gets hard to turn around things? I wasn't joking. Turning around is one of the time-consuming parts of plowing. And so if you make your fields rectangular and you have long furrows crosswise rather than short furrows, you need to turn around less. There's more, but I'm, I'm going to spare you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So I would be lying if I said this was the whole picture, or even the, the whole picture as regards the dependency graph. Um, and it's here that I go into a bit of, of speculation rather than, uh, <laughs> I'm not an expert on this by any means, but here I'm speculating a little more than usual. Um, all of the things on here are basically technological, right? And most of them were around in the year 900, right? Maybe not all in one place, but you know, people had figured it out. So why did it take 200 years, right? Sure, it's a complicated dependency graph, but people are smart. And part of the reason is that there's really at least two sort of broad groupings that you can put things in. There's social change and there's technological change. And you didn't just need to add technology to move to a three-field system. You also needed to change the social order. You need to change how people live their lives, right? So there's various ways in which this happened, but two concrete ways. You, you need to change, you need to rearrange real estate, right? You need to change who owned what land, what shape it was. And this is hard because people are kind of possessive of that, especially because it's their livelihood. Um, and on that note, uh, people were afraid, I think, of this new system. It was a change, and it was a change in something that had worked for centuries, and it was how people got food. You don't want to fuck with the way you make your food. You might end up starving. <laughs> and I think that this is also sort of true of technology, right? We work in software development. We like to think, or some of us like to think, I like to think on days when I don't have my thinking hat on, that software is driven primarily by technological concerns. But often social concerns factor in too. In particular, just to pick one example, right? Um, back when personal computers were a new thing, people didn't know how they should work. People didn't have lots of expectations. They didn't have lots of existing documents that they needed to work with. You know, it was wide open. And there were lots of different operating systems. There were lots of different design, uh, different uh, ways of interacting with your computer. And eventually, give it a few decades, and the dust settled, and we had two major operating systems plus a bunch of open source hangers on. And we had one main interaction model, Windows, icons, mouse, and pointer, and you know, one hanger on the terminal. And the reason this isn't technological, we know how to build things other than that. We can build things other than that. But people are used to it. People don't want to change, for good reasons. Um, so anyway, that was a kind of meandering 10 minutes. I hope you found something that you're interested in. And if you're interested in garbage collection, um, medieval agriculture, or wild speculations on the connection between technological and social change, come talk to me in the break.